No, we'll get started. We're here to talk this afternoon a little bit about alternatives to the learning management systems that we have on campus here. Um, my name is Daniel Beebe. I'm the Associate Director for Services at the Center for New Media Teaching and Learning. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming, first of all. Um, I also want to thank uh, several faculty members who engaged in an email exchange with me uh, to get some anecdotes and some quotes uh, from them for this session. Hopefully some of you are in the room. Uh, in some cases, I chose sort of random examples from, uh, from wikis and blogs and other things that we're doing on campus here. So I actually, in fact, don't know some of the folks that I'm, I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. Um, and um, so I thank them for their cases and for their input. And uh, hopefully, they'll be illuminating and illustrative uh, for you as, as teachers here. I um, also want to thank folks that I know who have a lot of expertise in this area. I, there are a lot of familiar faces in the room. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, one of my uh, coworkers said repeat offenders. I want to say uh, repeat customers or, or valued, valued customers. Um, rather than repeat offenders. Uh, and uh, also a lot of folks who know a lot about learning management systems and who've, who've used them for years. So um, hopefully I, I want to obviously do a presentation but also engage you in a conversation about learning management systems broadly. Now <clears throat> CCNMTL's services uh, vary and, and, and span a wide range of, of tools and, um, and events. So we offer um, faculty support in the faculty lab in 204 Butler Library. We have um, uh, on and off campus systems that we use to provide wikis and, and blogs and, other, and systems for faculty to use in their teaching. Um, documentation and as I mentioned workshops which we're going to be holding next week actually. Um, if you see something today that is of interest I don't want to um, I don't want to say you know don't stop by 204. I want to encourage you to come by 204 and meet Michael Cinemo who presented here last uh, the tough act to follow. Follow uh, and and meet him, but also come to our workshops, um, and where you get an opportunity not only to learn about a new tool, uh, but also to meet with your colleagues and your peers and help put the the, the things that you're going to be learning about in context. Um, so our overall goal is to help faculty members use technology purposefully to uh, find pedagogical applications for technology. And I think um, Tucker alluded to this earlier in his presentation. Uh, you know, we consider chalk to be a technology. Um, so we want to sort of talk with you about the range of technologies that might be available to you for your teaching. Uh, um, to, 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 and. I think another thing that Tucker alluded, alluded to as well is that we're not necessarily in the entertainment business. Um, I think that we think about students today as being the MTV generation. Maybe I'm dating myself a little bit because I'm sort of the MTV generation. Uh, but they, you know, they're, they're, they're coming from a different, different place as far as uh, education goes, as far as their social interactions go. And um, I think that some people say, I need to really punch up my, my course in order to uh, engage my students and to, and to help them learn. Um, we may try to belie that. A little bit during this session. So, but we are here to talk about learning management systems, that acronym there, LMS, that uh, is what that stands for, and to talk about some alternatives that faculty members might employ. So let's take a, a moment though to, to think about that term, LMS, learning management system. Right, learning is uh, is the the operative word, hopefully, and it's the only one that really has to do with with pedagogy or with education. Uh, management and system have to do with uh, orchestration and getting students sort of synchronized and keyed into the things that they need to do for their class on a weekly basis. So it's um, uh, hopefully a scenario where we think about alternatives might begin to open this up a little bit and begin to sort of present um, better educational results or, or offering better engagement, which is another term that came up during this morning's presentations. Can I just do a quick poll? Uh, how many folks were in this room all day? Okay, so a, a, a smattering of folks. I'm going to cover a couple of the points that, uh, that Tucker made uh, and, and that Michael made, and you'll just have to sort of snooze through those uh, folks who were here for the, for the rest of it, but it's actually a, a sort of a small group. Um, I wanted to, when I was thinking about this presentation, come up with a, a tree of life analogy uh, to sort of show the evolution of, of learning management systems in the market. And this one is conveniently provided by the Delta Initiative, which is a, it's a independent management consulting company. And it depicts the state of the art of the learning management system in 2009. And so what we can see here is um, uh, the Prometheus system, which I'm circling there, uh, which was in, uh, begun in 1998 uh, by the George Washington University, and it lived until 2002 when it was bought by Blackboard. Now, the other learning management system that we use on campus is called Sakai, and you can see it up at the top. 
It was started in its current form in 2004, around then, and it continues uh, to gain a small market share in the open source learning management system segment. All right, it's, it's actually used by a lot of universities, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But the reason that I bring up this, this image is that I want to sort of like draw this, this, this bright line here at 2005 and indicate that things really haven't changed much. Right? I mean, Blackboard has acquired a few more companies. Uh, it's really the Microsoft of the learning management system world. That's, it's an interesting you know, sort of place to be, the Microsoft of the learning management system world. Uh, it, it really is a, an enormous uh, learning management system, and I'm sure that a lot of you, if you've taught elsewhere, and even some folks who teach at Teachers College, use Blackboard in their teaching contexts. So it, it, other than that, though, other than the Blackboard absorbing a couple of different, different uh, uh, companies, not, not too much has changed. So to continue with the tree of life analogy, we use this image a couple of times throughout the presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Columbia University learning management system um, offerings and look at them in the context of sort of the chronology of the, of the broader web. So we see on the right hand side here, um, in 2000, it's not depicted on this image, but in 2000, 1999, 2000, 2001, CCNMTL worked with faculty members to develop their own course websites which were custom and based on a template that uh, CCNMTL staff members put together. I see some, some nodding heads in the room. There are folks who actually used that template here. Um, they can remember when we used chisel and hammer to make uh, course websites. And so we would work with faculty members to get their content together, their syllabi together, and we would build those pages in HTML and work with them in the faculty support lab, and then we would put those files up uh, via HTML up into the, the CUIT web servers. In uh, 2001, uh, we moved to, C uh, we worked with CUIT to implement CourseWorks, which is pro powered by Prometheus, uh, and we brought that to Columbia in 2001, and in 2002, in the spring, uh, is when people started using uh, CourseWorks in earnest. One of the things that really appealed to us back in 2001 was the uh, community that, that, the, that the Prometheus system had built around it. There were several other universities using the system and there was a great promise of, of further development um, and, and sort of collaboration among the university, universities that were using it. Um, Teachers College and the Business College here at Columbia were also using the system. And then, um, as I mentioned though a moment ago, um, Prometheus was bought um, shortly after we implemented it um, by Blackboard and the project was essentially killed at that point. Um, but we have continued to run it at Columbia since and our, our colleagues at CUIT have done a lot to, to improve it and Columbia, Columbia if I it, if you'll accept that as a word. Um, the Sakai project, which is indicated here with the little Sakai logo, uh, began in its current sort of form in 2004 as a collaboration among uh, several universities, and it grew out of this partnership uh, uh, between among the University of Michigan, Indiana, uh, MIT, and Stanford. And they worked to integrate a disparate uh, set of tools together into a collection of open source tools. This is a uh, community source system. It has a broad suite of tools uh, that leverage um, the strengths of a bunch of different academic institutions, um, commercial enterprises, individuals, and the goal is to sort of meet the, the teaching needs of today inside the learning management system in this open source platform. The Sky Foundation now has more than 100 members member institutions, that is. It's deployed worldwide uh, at hundreds of, of schools and universities. And Columbia has been piloting the system since 2005. And it's now in use by courses up at the Medical Center uh, and a handful of courses down here at the Morningside campus. So there are about uh, 100 courses using Sakai this semester. And that number will grow over the next coming uh, semesters as we begin to roll it out a little bit further in a controlled way. Now, CCNMTL has also worked with a number of services uh, and tools that faculty can integrate into their teaching. So Wikispaces, which is um, depicted by this little bonsai tree, uh, it was brought to campus in 2007, and Edblogs came on the scene last year. So these are wiki and blog solutions that faculty members can use in their teaching, and they're integrated with the university registrar systems to a degree, so they offer that um, the same sort of uh, security that a learning management system offers, but through a, a, a off-campus tool in some cases. To, to put this in the context of the broader web, we see that in 2001, the Wikipedia uh, project was, was really begun, and in 2003, the MediaWiki software that runs it uh, was spun off as a, as a public uh, consumer product. And that sort of corresponds to the timeline that, that introduced CourseWorks to Columbia. Um, we also see 
the YouTube uh, icon up there. YouTube was founded in early 2005, and that's about the time that we started using Sakai here in a, on a pilot mode. Uh, and Google Docs in early 2007 uh, became available to uh, people who used the Google Apps system, um, and that corresponds roughly to about when Wikispaces was brought to campus as well. So we see these sort of um, these broad trends on the web and some changes going on here at Columbia as well. Now I want to take a few minutes, the bulk of the presentation actually, to spend some time with um, some cases, look at some examples of how faculty members are using alternative learning management systems in purposeful ways in their teaching, and hopefully bring some of their own observations and some of their own anecdotes into this presentation, and, uh, and, and essentially bring them into the room to talk with us a little bit about it. Um, before we look at these cases though, I do want to point out this. This uh, Seven Things article, it's in your packet, it's on the right side, uh, if I'm not mistaken, towards the back. I'm trying to, that's essentially a verbal hyperlink to this document. Uh, this is uh, Seven Things article from the folks over at Educause. It's called the Seven Things You Should Know About LMS Alternatives. Um, it was originally played a large part in this presentation. I've since sort of boiled that down, boiled that out essentially, because you can read. Uh, so you can read this. Um, give it a look. It's a worthwhile article, especially if you're interested in this, this sort of, of thing. And it's one of many excellent articles from the Educause folks in this Seven Things series. If you Google Seven Things, uh, you'll be able to find a, a number of articles on a number of subjects that are covered here today. And they really boil it down very succinctly into a two-page document that, that is very accessible. It's a good res reference to return to after this session and because some of the cases that I'm going to refer to now have elements of, of this article within it. So these cases represent, in a lot of, in a lot of um, scenarios, real organic developments which were done by faculty alone or with CCNMTL staff members. And some of these are experimental, but each of them represents a real deliberate, sort of thoughtful way of, of applying educational technology to the classroom. And as we look at these, we're going to investigate what reasons, right? What, what problematics, what problem is a faculty member trying to solve or investigate as they use a, an LMS alternative? So this question, or problematic is, is what we call it at CCNMTL, is essentially um, what are they trying to solve, what are they trying to bring in, into their classroom, and what do they want to try to have the LMS alternative do? These questions are going to show up on the next slides too. So in this case, we have um, a Wikispaces site from an art, uh, art humanities instructor, Tina Rivers. Um, she sent me a rather lengthy email where she talked about it, and I'll try to bring some of her experiences into, um, into this, this segment of the presentation. And a couple of quotes to, to sort of kick it off. Tina said that CourseWorks doesn't let me invite students to collaborate in meaningful ways. And she also said that students engage both with each other and with the course materials. So these are two short quotes that sort of illustrate the, the larger context of what she wanted her students to do in her class. So in this case, the problematic is to improve student collaboration. Right? How, can I how can I improve student collaboration? And whenever we do these sorts of presentations <coughs> um, among ourselves uh, with our own staff members, the uh, question comes up, the, the so what question, you know, what so what? You know, collaboration, what does that mean? Uh, why is it important? And this, this is the, the question that I tried to get to with Tina as well. Um, Tina Rivers uh, has this, this uh, course wiki site and she does a couple of different things with it. Um, the contention with this site is that she's going to develop assignments that are going to lead to different types of collaboration. And a subset of this, why is collaboration important? Uh, because she felt that there's too much work being done in isolation. So her students were essentially you know, looking at some artwork, going to, to class, discussing it, going home and writing something about it, or working on something about it, but it was really being done in isolation. Now, the result of that is that all 21 students in her Art Hum class were essentially doing the same thing, and she was getting turned into her 21 identical results, essentially. I mean, it, it's a happy coincidence if all of her students are essentially able to you know, produce something that is that's consistent, uh, it proves that they're sort of learning it, but it's also essentially for her reading the same thing 21 times. So she felt that the students could benefit from their peers' work and gain a sense of community via uh, collaboration as well. So the primary assignment for her course is uh, that the students sign up in pairs, uh, and through the course of the, the 13 weeks of the semester, they sign up for one of 13 topics. 
So I'm going to bring up her course wiki in order to begin to demonstrate this. Now, this came right up because I had already signed into Wikispaces, but Wikispaces uses Columbia Uni authentication. So um, just anybody else want to give me an amen or just, just um, trust me on that one? All right, good. All right. So uh, anyway, so I've, I've logged in. You can see in the upper right-hand corner that it's indicated there's my uni that, that I'm here. And um, I'm going to take you over to the Amiam page where she provides a, um, a structure for the page. She's, she has seeded this page with a number of elements. So she's put up readings at the top, some notes, some media. And so she began essentially this summer putting this site together where she uploaded the files that she wanted her students to read. She found the links uh, to external sites that she wanted to have and she built the, the top part of the page. And further down we see Evan and Jasmine's work here <coughs> where they develop an Amiam page with general information again gleaned from the lecture and from the readings uh, that anybody can use essentially in the class as a study guide. So in this case Evan and Jasmine have put together a short uh, encyclopedic entry based on these materials and in, in this case uh, Evan and Jasmine collaborate with each other right, with the content and to a degree with the instructor and I'll take a look at that in a, in a, in a half second here uh, and they also develop a resource that all of the members of the class can use. And in this case Tina has one assignment essentially to correct and uh, she did that actually and I'm going to take a look at the history tab of this page uh, because she found that there was essentially an error. If we look at the last time that Evan uh, edited the page and we compare it to the last time that Tina edited the page, we can see that she's gone in here and the red indicates something that she's deleted and the green indicates something that she's, she's added. So she found a factual error, she corrected that factual error and she added some more information in order to create a study guide that all of the 20, of all of the 19 other students and the two who wrote it could refer back to and have as a resource going down the road. So some other outcomes. Um, on the first day of class, Tina was able to send her students out um, to do a short assignment where they walked around campus and they took photographs of the uh, different types of columns on campus. So this reading Columbia assignment was was, was uh, assignment that they did on the first day of classes. And this is normally done in, in Art Hum courses. You know, walk around, look at the columns, and, and write about them. And in this case, what Tina gains by looking uh, at, at this assignment this way is she put the students in groups of four, she had them walk around use their digital cameras or cell phones to take photos of these different types of columns and then, and then upload those images into the course wiki. They gained a couple of things in, in this exercise. They gained uh, knowledge of their peers. Um, they got to meet three or four of their, their uh, students, fellow students on the first day of class and uh, Tina also gets a cache of images that she can use throughout the semester or in subsequent semesters about ionic and Doric columns on campus here. So it, it sort of packs a one-two punch. Like a traditional uh, learning management system, Tina broke her course down into weekly topics. So if we take a look at the syllabus page over here, we see that she's got a, a pretty traditional syllabus breakdown here. Um, but unlike a typical learning management system, wikis can be edited by anybody in the course, right? So she doesn't necessarily want to have her students editing her syllabus. So she used a feature inside the, the, uh, the wiki to lock that page. So only she can edit it, well, and I can edit it, and a couple of other people who work at CCNMTL can. But her students broadly cannot do that. Um, she. Uh, also has restricted this wiki to all of her course members. So like a typical learning management system, this isn't something that's open and, and out on the broad, uh, broader web for anyone to get to and for anyone to edit. And like a typical learning management system, <clears throat> the wiki has a very simple interface. Um, when you click on the edit button in CourseWorks, you're presented with a very simple interface to edit um, the page. And the same is true of, of a wiki or of another system um, too. <clears throat> Slightly different than a learning management system, though, that has a suite of tools, assignments, for example, and, and lectures and syllabus, um, the wiki doesn't have this suite of tools, right? And, and instead, what it has is a way of sort of working those sorts of tools into a system like this. So there's no official syllabus tool inside a wiki, but she's able to, to provide a page which plays that role. And also, inside of each of the session pages that she develops, so when we go back to the Amiom page, the assignment, the content, and everything is in one page along with the student contribution. So really, it, it, it's an integrated page um, that doesn't need to send students out to many different sections to complete the uh, task of the day. It also sort of brings everything right into one location. 
Um, also to point out that, that it's really easy to embed media within these pages. As you can see, her students were able to put that image of Amiyan in the page as well. One of the other things that she wants her students to be able to do is to tag these pages. And it's a, it's a nice feature of tools like wikis and blogs, which we'll look at in a little bit as well. They can use these, these sort of, sorts of tags, like we see over here in this tag cloud, to begin to sort of make thematic connections across the arc of the semester. So rather than looking at the Parthenon, then Amiyan, then going on to other topics, and sort of looking, that, looking at them as a chain of, of, of events, something to be studied in week two and then not looked at again, you can sort of begin to apply thematic um, over, you know, overarching themes to a number of pages and to a number of topics and hopefully bring some cohesion to the class as it sets up over the, over the course of the semester. It is to be noted though that Tina reported that this took a lot of time for her to set up. Okay, and this is one of, the, one of the concerns that faculty members come to me with when they do something like this. She also did note that she's going to be able to reuse this from semester to semester. So she doesn't see this as being something that she's going to use once and then throw away. She'll be able to use the content that she developed early in the semester and migrate it forward to another semester and use it again. Next, I'd like to take a look at a Music Humanities blog. This is from Maya Carrere. Um, I'm going to read a couple of quotes from her as well. I found CourseWorks Discussion Board to be cumbersome and uh, navigate, uh, sorry, cumbersome to navigate and track. And another quote, the blog gives students a great sense of ownership of the course to, a very, to very productive effects. All right, so this is really the, the question that we wanted to begin to answer with, with Maya in this case. Um, and one of my colleagues did work with her on this. And it was this sense of ownership. Okay, so how do you instill a sense of ownership among students uh, and in their listening and in their writing assignments? And the contention is in, the contention is in this case that if we use a blog, um, it's going to put the student's writing in front of other students. Okay? It's going to raise the profile of the student's writing since everybody's going to be able to see each other's work. And not every student was required to write each week. So this again sort of adds to the sense of ownership that she set it up so that there were 14 weeks in the semester, but the students only needed to write 10 of those 14 weeks. So they could choose the weeks that were of most interest to them. And they also were required to read all of the postings that their peers put up inside the blog space. So they had to come into class prepared. She had a time limit imposed on the students' uh, work. Uh, she made them post at least 24 hours prior to the class session so the students had an opportunity to read uh, these items. So here's a little quote about this, um, about her use of the ten, 10 of 14 weeks. At least seven of those assignments must pertain directly to the reading or listening assignment, and three can be works of any style or period to which the students can apply analytical, analytical terminology acquired in class. So not only do they have the freedom to choose the weeks that they want to cover, but they can also choose the topics that they want to cover in some of those weeks as well. So she gave them a little bit of, of time, a little bit of uh, space to, to bring their own work into this. So Maya likes the fact, that, the fact that students can use media in their posts and that they can categorize their posts as well. So they begin to see, again, this, this thematic sort of, of thing arise in the, in the course of the semester. Now let's go ahead and take a look at, at her course blog for a moment. Aha, it is going to ask me to log in. So this would work really well with CourseWorks because you can log into CourseWorks and then just click on your, your blog link and it would take you right into your blog because since you've already logged into CourseWorks, it's taken care of. So let's get out to the site here. So we can see the individual posts uh, that, have been, that have been put up here by students. So this is a way that, that, um, that Maya can go in and look at the work that Allison has done, for example. She can go in here and get an idea of the posts that Allison has done. Or if we want to see Manu, we can see this. And we can see all of the posts that, that uh, he has made. And Liza, for example, we can not only see the posts that she's made, but the comments that she's made on other people's posts as well. So this is a uh, participants tool that we've built that allows faculty members to get a collection of their students' work together in one location. This also provides th these, uh, these other sort of, sort of ways of looking at the content. We can look at it in terms of categories. We can look at it chronologically both in terms of posts and comments. So we've got a number of different ways of looking at the course content here. 
Like a traditional learning manage management system, only registered students can access the course blog. Uh, there's, uh, there was another um, faculty member who sent me some notes about his blog today. He also pointed out that like with traditional discussion boards, these are a really good way, blogs are a really good way to bring out shy, shy students' comments. You can um, have a student who maybe is, is, is challenged by language or wants to spend some more time with the content and really get his or her thoughts together, put them into a blog in, in uh, written format and then bring those comments into the classroom and be able to say, you know, one of your peers said X, Y, Z. I thought that was really compelling. What do you think of that? So it's a really good way to sort of draw out shy or, or challenged students. In Maya's class, she uh, makes a new site every year. So like a traditional learning management system uh, and, and the work that happens there, that process of building the posts and of building the themes is a very important part of this. So essentially she burns this site down every year. She starts off with a new one. And so that's another similarity that it shares with a traditional learning management system in some cases. Um, so she doesn't use these materials uh, semester after semester. She can migrate to a new blog and she can get started with things uh, fresh. Also like the, the traditional learning management system, there is an element of choice. So not only in the sense that she can choose, you know, that she and her students can choose which assignments that they want to do, but they can also choose the tools that they want to use, right? So, so they can choose to use um, different plugins and, and different tools inside the Edblog system that can really help meet their needs. Unlike a traditional learning management system though, um, Blogs expand functionality from what's a, for what is available to Maya beyond the discussion board, for example, this concept of themes, the use of media within posts, and that one-stop evaluation system that I just showed you a second ago with the participants page really sort of adds value for her. And finally, the Edblog system um, can be used mobily. Um, so this is one of the things that our colleagues at, at Lido, who have set up the Edblog system for us, have, have really worked with us in a really uh, great way, is to get this tool, the Edblog system, available on smartphones, for example, um, so it's portable and ready to go. So in the case of a faculty member who wants to do field studies, for example, students could actually do their blogging directly from a, a device or from a smartphone. I think that this quote from Maya sums up the, 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 the experience here. Students seem to have an increased need to communicate how they found their own ways of wrapping their minds around somewhat less immediate immediately approachable repertoire, such as certain uh, contemporary music, by finding analogies in other arts and other disciplines. What more can an instructor wish, wish for than students actively pursuing their own individual anchoring of certain knowledge? They've invested a, an explorer's energy into it. Isn't this how uh, they will best remember it? It's a, it's a satisfying thing to see that certain conversations lingered on the blog beyond the assignment and beyond the tests. Right, so the students were actually going back and commenting on things that had happened earlier in the semester that they were no longer being graded on. And I think that that's one of the things that you as instructors will all, will all relate to. You know, am I going to be graded on this, right? And, and the idea that, that, in fact, she may grade them on that, on that uh, tenacity and that ability to go back and look at these things later, but it's not something that they're asking her about. It's just something that they're doing. Now, in this next case, um, folks who were here earlier were, are going to be seeing a little bit of repeat performance. This is uh, a look at an at, uh, uh, ex external tool called VoiceThread and uh, Kevin Griffin's, Griffin's use of it in the Global Honors College. To give a little bit of context here, the Global Honors College is a uh, program that happens in uh, the lead up over, the, over this last summer to a three week session in Waseda, Japan, where students from all over the world got together to discuss sustainable development issues. Now this quote from, from Kevin uh, sort of begins to frame this. I really loved the way that the lecture could become a conversation. This is the way that I like to teach in person, and this feature in VoiceThread meant that I could teach that way online. So the problem here is to deliver lectures to international students, right, people who are distributed all over the world, so that they could review at their own time and at their own pace and be able to provide feedback on the lectures as they saw them. And the hypothesis, or the way that we, we, we decided to attack this problem was to use VoiceThread. And as Michael mentioned earlier, this is traditionally seen as a so social annotation tool, right? You can put up an, an image or you can put up a video and students or visitors can annotate that video um, and, and draw on it directly. But if you tweak it slightly, it becomes a presentation or lecture tool. And it's one that students can access asynchronously. 
They can access it whenever they want, whatever time zone they're in, and they can access it at their own pace. So the primary assignment in, in the context of the Global Honors College was that their co-teachers and Kevin were delivering lectures to students around the globe in preparation for this three-week session in Waseda, at Waseda University in Japan. They needed this tool that would allow them to do the lecture materials on the web. And uh, CCNM Tales Educational Technologists helped them come up with this tool so that they could easily upload their images, upload their slides, and begin to speak over those and narrate those slides as, uh, narrate and annotate those slides as they did them. So let's bring this up. Oh, so, um, so I just want to point out one other thing before I do. After the instructor has spoken the content of the slide, essentially, as Michael showed earlier, other people can chime in. So I can add another track, essentially, to that, to that presentation slide, and more information can sort of come out. So as we take a look at this voice thread, Hi, everyone. Welcome back. All right, so Kevin pops up and he says, hi, everyone. Welcome back. And he has a talking head here where he basically can cover the information. And as he talks about it, I, as the student, can you know, zoom in, take a look at what he's actually talking about, zoom in on a part of a picture maybe if he's describing that, um, and sort of get, as Michael talked about earlier, this concept of information coming in in dual channels. In the third slide, Michael also pointed this out. There's the ability for, Mike, for uh, Kevin to talk about the slide, but also to draw on that slide. And as he does his presentation through this, through this, uh, the, the course of these, the slide set, he does that. He draws on the slide, and he really draws people's attention to the thing that he's talking about at that time. Now, the individual uh, class members here, and in this case, Wu jumps in, and we can see that the timeline jumped forward here to this point, and it's sort of moving along, though she just put up a, a, a text question. She had a question about the, the lecture, and then the instructor could see that that's come in and provide some feedback about the lecture. <coughs> One of the other co-teachers who's represented over here with this icon, I can click on him, and again, it jumps the playhead forward to where, uh, where this co-teacher, Lok Ming, had something to say about that question as well. So this becomes not only a way of delivering the lecture, but a way of sort of getting feedback, getting comments back, and even improving the lecture materials uh, among, among the students. This um, lecture can be embedded inside a learning management system. This is what Kevin did in this case. Science Students didn't necessarily go out to VoiceThread to view the lectures. They simply tuned into the syllabus, they went to the session, they saw this embedded within the syllabus session, and they hit play. Now, that student who left the comment had to log in. She had to set up a VoiceThread account, log in, and make her comment. But just to view this, the, the stuff, she didn't need to log in at all. So. Uh, I'm going to read a quote from Professor Griffin that talks about the sort of slide-by-slide -slide um, nature of this. He, he, had, he did his um, voiceover on a slide-by-slide -slide nature, and he saw this as a double-edged sword. The other blessing or curse of VoiceThread is the way that you record one slide at a time. I really loved this because it meant that I could keep working until I got it the way I wanted it, and editing was a breeze. It also meant that it took forever to do this because I just kept doing it over and over until I got it the way I wanted it. So if you have this penchant for perfection, you may want to move on. Uh, but if, you, if you're able to sort of uh, record your lecture uh, slide by slide and be happy with the results. It takes as long as it takes to speak it to develop something like this. So if your lecture is 45 minutes long, it'll take you 45 minutes to do this. There's no what we call in the jargon of the industry post-production. It just happens sort of live. So with a little bit of care, you, you can obviously do the slides that you really messed up. You can do those over. And there, there's, you're not sort of putting all your eggs in one basket. But if you're OK with, with ums, uhs, pauses, hold on a seconds, you're going to be fine. Um, so <clears throat> let me see what I wrote here. Uh, OK, so also this refers back to Tucker's uh, comments from, from earlier. Um, and to ask, I just wanted to sort of ask quickly, how many folks lecture in the classroom? How many, how many folks have been in a class where you've had a lecture, like where you've watched a lecture? I, I, yeah, come on, rhetorical question. Everybody's hand goes up. Um, so, so if you've been in a lecture recently, you see a lot of laptops. And I think Tucker you know, pointed this out in his session, that, that when students are in the classroom and they have their laptop open, uh, and we saw this great video that he showed where he zoomed in on a laptop of an MIT student, and they had Facebook open, and they had Twitter open, and they had uh, you know, a chat program open, you're going to lose students. Right, you're going to lose students, and it may only be for 15 or 20 seconds at a time. But that may be like right when you tell, when you say the word "not," you know, or when you when you show the the evidence that actually refutes the thing that you've been talking about for the last 15 minutes. So, 
Presenting materials in a format like this is compelling for a number of reasons. You basically move it out of the classroom and you can do things in the classroom that require students essentially to close the lid or to, if they're going to be chatting or they're going to be looking something up, they're using the information that they're finding out from the web or from somebody else. You know, they could use a lifeline with, um, with that, that television show. Um, so uh, you, can, you can see that maybe thinking about the lecture in a different way, moving part of it out of the classroom and onto the web is a, is a way that you could uh, get around some of those things that Tucker was talking about in his Digital Natives presentation earlier. So obviously this example here, this is not a learning management system. This is a, a supplemental tool that you can use in the context of a learning management system to bring uh, materials into it in a compelling way. It might, it might sort of tangentially replace one of the elements of a learning management system, and that is the discussion board, right? This idea that you can ask questions about the lecture in the context of the lecture, um, synchronously with the lecture, is something that might begin to sort of supplement or, or transplant one of those things. Um, this relates back a little bit to the seven things article that's in your packet. Um, like all of the other tools that Michael talked about earlier and the tools that I'm talking about today, these are all available for free. Now the free version of, of VoiceThread allows you to record three lectures. It does not allow you to download those lectures. They're essentially caught on the web. Um, but there it was a $99 um, version of this that, that um, Kevin and his, his co-teachers co thought was worthwhile. They used it over the course of the semester. And um, they were able to do as many lectures as they wanted. And they were able to pull them out of the system as well. So they, they found that that, that that investment was really, really important. Um, other tools, so, th so there's this concept of, and I hate this term, but I'm going to use it anyway because it is the term. Freemium is this idea that there's a free version and a premium version. And as Michael also mentioned during his presentation session, some of the premium versions of these tools are available to you as instructors with your columbia.edu address. You can get uh, a, an upgraded version of Prezi, for example, which is one of these tools that allows you to do these um, sort of 30,000 foot zooming presentations, which was uh, one of the things that Michael showed during his session. So just because there's a, a pay version doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be locked out as an educator. So we're going to take a look at uh, another example here. This is, um, let me find myself here. This is uh, Sim Ramirez's uh, course wiki. And Sim teaches in the undergraduate writing program. She decided to use wiki spaces for her course. And a couple of quotes here. Um, LMSs are restrictive and detached from the prevailing online language structures and conventions that our students employ. And another quote here, Wikispaces allow, allows me to design assignments that facilitate collaborative learning. So it goes back to this collaborative learning question. But it's also a question of how her students can learn from each other. She really pointed that out to me, that her students oftentimes grapple with the texts that they use in their class. And that, in fact, they need a hand. Um, and what, what she has found in the use of her wiki is that when stronger students post or write something in the wiki, their peers can tune in on that, get an idea of, of what other people think, and, and sort of kickstart the way that they're thinking about the texts. So as they do their, their weekly assignments, uh, let me bring up her site, they, they tag these, these assignments again so that, they, that, that Sim can essentially collect those assignments. So we'll take a look at, uh, at the assignments page here, and we'll just go into week one, I guess. Um, and so at the bottom of this week one page, we see all of these letters of introduction that have been collected at the bottom of the page here. And that's simply facilitated by her pulling in an RSS feed of all of the pages that have been tagged introduction, for example. So she's able to sort of uh, hand out the assignments to students within this page and again collect those assignments right inside the page here. I want to point out that the, this concept of collaborative learning doesn't mean group work in, in, her, in her case. So it's not uh, Evan and Jasmine getting together to write one article. It's <coughs> students sort of depending on each other to do uh, the classwork to help their, their peers become stronger and, and help guide their peers. Um, so let me also show another way that, that, so she collects her assignments this way. She can see um, all of the introduction articles that have been turned in. But she can also go over here to the Manage Wiki area. And she can look at the wiki statistics and look at all of the members of the course site. And she can get an idea of how many edits, how many pages each of the members of her course wiki have worked on. So she gets, again, this sort of you know, overview or this control panel where she can go in and see who's done what over the course of the semester. I can see that uh, CFL has done these pages. So Connie L. has done those pages in the, in the class. 
She reports that she's moved some of the workshopping, okay, and this, this is something that they do in the undergraduate writing program to look at other students' papers and to comment on those. She's moved that out of the classroom. So students can um, go to the wiki, read people's writing assignments, and come into the classroom prepared. So there's, there's less of this floating around in the classroom, less paper, and there's more sort of preparation coming into the classroom. So rather than handing out their papers to their peers and then reading them, and spending that time in the classroom, and then moving on to the work of critique, they get to do that right from the beginning of the class session. So how is this similar or, or different than uh, using a course management system? She's used a couple of tools in a, uh, in a what we call, we like to call a loosely coupled manner. This is the concept of, of using more than one tool in her teaching. And if we look at her syllabus, for example, I think she found that the, that the formatting that was available to her inside the wiki might have been a little restrictive. And she preferred you know, that sort of word processor, the Microsoft Word version of, of, of things. So she just put her syllabus up in a Google Doc. She shared it with anybody who has the link, and she put that link inside of her Wikispaces site. So she's able to sort of leverage both the power of the wiki as a place to, to organize her students, but also things like Google Docs to put documents that she wants to have that formatting and printability. <clears throat> She also notes that the, that the LMSs, as I mentioned a moment ago, are detached from the prevailing online language instructors and conventions of, of, stu of students' current work. And I took this to mean that the LMS, the, the Courseworks or Sakai, uh, and any of these tools actually, and it was, it's true of, of all of them, can shape the assignment. So like Tufti argues in uh, Michael, Michael's presentation earlier, PowerPoint is limiting in its way of doing presentations. It, it, it naturally has that header and bullets um, ecosystem built in. Um, all of these tools form assignments essentially to work to their strengths and to their weaknesses, right? So that, that, power, that, that PowerPoint being cognitively limiting, limiting applies to the learning management systems of all, all shapes and colors as well. Um, the wiki is a little bit more freeform though. She's able to sort of do as she wishes with it. Um, she gets to change any of the, the look and feel and also the navigation and everything. Um, and in some cases, the learning management system is the only place where you can really put feedback for students, right? I mean, this is, this is one of the great strengths of the learning management system. There's a grade book. Um, I would not, I would be really shy to put a spreadsheet up there that had everybody's grades in a column, right? I mean, anybody can, can read any other grade. And by the, by the nature of the learning, of the uh, wiki itself, people can edit any page, right? So I want to change my grade, just go in and hit edit. Um, but, but, I've noted that some faculty members have actually polled their students, and if they have a, an overwhelming agreement, and by overwhelming I mean 100%, if every student agrees, they'll actually provide all of the feedback for, the, for their writing assignments short of a letter grade inside the wiki. So if we go to, um, I wrote down where to head for this, but uh, let's go to assignments. And we'll take a look at assignment two, and we'll go down to Beatrice. We can see that she's written her proposal here, Right, which is her proposal for her for her um, lens essay, and there's a comment here from the instructor. Now, this is the feedback on the uh, on the assignment. This is um, all of the the information that uh, that Sim would normally provide to her students. Um, Ten of the 16 students in the class have looked at this feedback. Right, so it means that not only are they looking at their own feedback. And not only are they writing their own assignments, but they're reading their peers' assignments and they're looking at their peers' feedback. So they're getting an idea of what strong writing looks like and they're creating a culture of you know, really strong scholarly writing within their wiki. Now, obviously this is a small room and I don't expect you all to take photographs and take this stuff out of the room. This is restricted to her students, right? Just like the learning management system, they've come up with a pact, they've agreed that they're going to have feedback within the wiki site. And it's a very powerful uh, tool for her teaching. So, quoting from uh, Sim on this, on this subject, seeing each other's work helps them co come to an implicit consensus as a class on what makes a good piece of academic writing. In class discussions, students have pointed out the strengths of their peers' writings posted in the wiki. Right, so they're not only bringing, you know, they're not only bringing the wiki content into the, uh, into the classroom, they're bringing their peers' wiki content into the classroom. So they're building their own good ideas of what good writing is. And I think that that's really, you know, in this course, that's a really, really powerful and really important aspect of it. Um, some students come into the classroom with some, some previous knowledge of these tools uh, that they can transfer from, from the real world. This goes back to Tucker's conversation earlier about, about digital natives. Uh, and so using these tools fits more closely with what they experience, right? 
they come into, into some of these classes with some knowledge of how to use a wiki. Uh, and so it, it, it fits in the vernacular of what they, of what they talk about. So one way that students show, from, this is a quote from Sim, one way that students show their familiarity and comfort with the organization and vernacular of the Wikispaces site is by using that site in innovative and productive ways that we have not gone over in class. So for one example, I suggested that the students, oh, this is before I suggested that the students read each other's work in the Wiki. Many had already done so on their own. So they're branching out and they're doing these things on their own and a tool like this affords these sort of collaborations. And perhaps the quote that ties this up best uh, is from Sam here again. Several of my students have also written papers that cite their classmates' ideas from the wiki and class discussion. So th these students are excited um, to acknowledge the class as a collaborative academic com community. And this is really what she wanted to get to, get to is, is to have her students help each other and work as a collaborative team. Okay, now we've got another example here, and this is sort of a, a fun one, because I'm going to be doing a demonstration that I haven't tried yet. So we'll see how it, how it actually flies. Um, so in this case, it's a rather simple <laughs> problematic. Ruth uh, Padua over at the Journalism School teaches Reading and Writing 1. Um, she wanted to have her students read. She wanted to have her students do the assignments. And so she was having a hard time putting up all the files in her Courseworks or Sakai site because um, the, the learning management system's uh, file management system is very forms driven. Um, there are some ways to connect to it um, via a tool called WebDAV, uh, but, but it's very complicated and she found that she was writing over folders and actually losing reading files and she really became frustrated with it and, and, and uh, told me that in no uncertain terms. Uh, so, she, so it's a really simple problematic, and that it, but it was difficult to crack. And that was, how can she quickly and easily distribute readings to the students? And the quote that I have from her was via an email, and it is, it's almost time to crack the champagne against the side of the ship. So we had tried several times and failed, and then we came up with this dropbox.com solution. Um, so she has 30 reading topics over the course of the semester. And inside each of those reading topic folders, there can be anywhere from three to 10 different readings. Um, and the students were responsible for reading all of these things, but they changed dramatically from week to week, right? So she is writing on specific topics in a journalism class, and she doesn't want to have something from 2009 in there. She wants to have something from 2011 in there, if she could. Like she, wants to, she wants to have the newest press that's available on a subject so that it's fresh for her students. So. Um, as we talked about a moment ago, the, the forms-driven nature of the learning management systems file managers posed some trouble, so we came up with this Dropbox.com account. Now, Dropbox.com is a, it's a free um, site again. Uh, let me just go ahead and log into Sakai. Um, it's a free site that allows you two gigabytes of, of free storage. And the thing that is powerful about this is it's not only it's loading. Uh, it's not only available on the website, dropbox.com, but it's also available on her desktop. And in Ruth's case, this is one of the other big, problem, big problems, and you may all be able to relate to this as well. She has three desktops. She has one at home, she has one laptop, and she has one in her office. Okay, so she's got three different locations that she was managing files from. And so we can just click on this here where it says read, and there's this on Dropbox in parentheses after it. And there's this folder of, of files that comes up. And these are all of the read files that she has available to her. This is available on the cloud, OK? So all of these reading f files are hidden by security, by obscurity, right? So she essentially shared the, fo the folder with herself. She didn't email it to anybody. She just embedded it right into her Sakai site. Now, the thing that I'm, this is why I'm sort of flying by my pants, seat of my pants here, is that I'm going to actually log in to Dropbox to my own account, and I'm going to copy this reading folder into my own account. And what this uh, implies is that any time Ruth changes a reading, it's going to synchronize to my own Dropbox.com account. And if I have this laptop here is not my own, but over in that bag right there, is my laptop, and if it were on and open, it would be synchronizing these files from the reading folder to that machine. Okay, I have a cell phone in my pocket, and if I bring up dropbox.com, this is the part where I keep my fingers crossed a little bit. There's a good Dropbox app, actually. That's, I'm sorry, that's what I'm bringing up, is the, is the Dropbox app. Um, and I get out of my chords folder, which has all my guitar stuff. Um, I now see a read folder here, it just came up. 
Okay? And inside that read folder, as it synchronizes, all the files that Ruth has put up for her class to read are going to appear on my phone. So it's portable for me now. I can do my readings on the subway. I just have to synchronize the files that I want to actually download and view offline, and I can do that. The other thing that's sort of exciting about this is that as I bring up Dropbox, the application on the desktop here, and this is going to be a, a, just a click through a couple of things, and this is why I wanted to do it this way, even though it requires me to do all of this, is I'm doing it live. <coughs> Again, there's a this freemium service. You know, you get the free or, or larger spaces. And what it's doing is it's telling me now, it should be OK. It's showing, it'll show this, and I can open up my Dropbox folder on, this own, on my own machine here. Notice that the Dropbox folder is here in the CCMTL guest folder. Uh, I turned on Growl, sorry about that. All right, but I can see in here now this read folder has got all of those, those 30 folders with all of the readings in it. And it's going to take a little bit of a moment for that to synchronize. But I, as a student now, have on my phone and my desktop all of the files that Ruth has. And when Ruth changes Wednesday's reading on Tuesday night, that's going to show up on my phone, and it's also going to show up on my desktop. So she does all of her file management from the desktop. It shows up on my desktop and on my phone, and it's all really nicely integrated with the Sakai site as well. So it's it's a it's sort of a win 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 in a couple in a couple of situations here. All right, so I went through all of these notes. If you edit an individual file, it changes too. Yeah. So if I edit an individual file in a subfolder, so if she edits, no, sorry, she edits, because she owns the folder. If she adds a new file, or she swaps out a file, right, so this reading that we did by Edward Said changed for some, like somebody added some new comments to it or something, she can just drop a new copy in, and it syncs for everybody in the background. Okay. Um, so this is an example, another example of these sort of loosely coupled tools, right? Using Google as a syllabus, using Dropbox as a file management system. And this isn't the way that she collects her assignments from her students. She still uses the Sakai system for that. She still collects her assignments in the files area there. But the readings folder was really what was really becoming tough for her, going in and managing all these files on a consistent basis, sometimes on a daily or hourly basis. And so now all she needs to do is on any of her machines go into that read folder, drop the new thing in there, and she's all set. Um, Another thing to point out here is that it's not restricted to the learning management system, right? So she can continue to use these folders on her own desktop over the, the winter break. She can continue to use these folders in spring 2010. She can continue to use these folders next summer when she's collecting the materials for, for her fall class and just integrate the same folder, which is still on all of her laptop, in her desktop and at work, and her, on her laptop and even on her phone. She can just sort of continue to use these folders as the place where she keeps her readings for, for this reading and writing one course, which she offers semester after semester. So it's a great tool to use across the boundaries of many semesters. Now, the last case we'll take a look at here, um, and how am I doing for time? I'm doing okay for time, um, is, is uh, in the sociology department. And this is another blog example. This is Alondra Nelson, and uh, she teaches a course called The Social Life of DNA. You didn't know that DNA had a social life, did you? Um, and so there's a quote here to sort of kick off this case, and it is, I encourage my students to use the blog to experiment with a different type of scholarly prose from what they might uh, be used to writing in a paper. Okay, so what she wants to do with this is give students a new voice. It gives students a less jargony voice, a less technical voice, give them a more down-to-earth voice, and her proposal is that having a public blog will do that. Okay, so students write a weekly paper. Um, this blog uh, replaces that. They don't write a paper every week. They alternate. So the students either are writers, authors, or commenters. Um, so they can either write a post or comment on posts. Um, and she writes here, I, I'm using the blog to replace the short weekly papers that graduate students might typically submit to me and to other students in preparation for class. So this is something that she's always done. She's always had her students write a paper, print it out, hand it out, and then they read each other's work. So the blog really facilitates that. And like Maya's Music Hum class that I mentioned earlier, all the students don't post each week. They, they do alternate this, this um, role between posters and commenters. Additionally, the site, as I mentioned a moment ago, is available to the public. So she has a list of about 150 people who she has invited to come and look at this blog. It's available to the open web, but she's invited these people to come and read the blog on a regular basis. And she also uh, expects them at some point, they haven't started doing it yet, but to offer comments to her students. So it's, 
not necessarily that they've started to comment, but the students know that those viewers are there. So you know, they're the 18 students or the 10 students in the class, but they know that there's 150 other people out there in the world that are reading their blog, right? So it sort of raises the stakes, uh, and it really does sort of put a price on writing well for a broader audience. They can write very technically uh, for themselves, but she wants, to treat, she wants to have them come up with a new writing voice, and th she thinks that that public face of the site will affect that. So how is it character characteristically similar to a, a traditional learning management system? Uh, it's similar in that you can integrate tools from outside. Um, so CourseWorks will accept the voice thread that we talked about earlier. It'll accept Dropbox, uh, like, like Sakai does. Um, she also uses a, uh, a Twitter feed, and I'll just show this. She brings in tweets from her students uh, about research and other things that they're working on. So down here towards the bottom, we can see this sort of Twitter feed. And this isn't something that's unique to the way that AdBlogs works. Any learning management system will do this. Um, it's, it is unique, though, in the sense that they have a public face to the blog. Um, it's possible to make certain parts of a coursework site available to the public, but the entirety of a coursework site cannot be made public. If you're going to do this, it, you have to have a special relationship with your students, and they have to understand that this stuff is going to be out in the world, and they have to be, you know, ready and willing to do that. Um, but in this case, Alondra has done that, and it's uh, it's been a really really powerful and, and good thing for her to do with her students. So. I put this slide up here to scare you, uh, but I'll walk through a couple of points and hopefully it won't be quite as bad. But um, what kind of, uh, of, of elements are available? And so this is a modified version of what we saw a moment ago with the Columbia um, <laughs> Learning Management Systems over there on the right. In the middle, um, we have the Columbia Curated Tools, which is a list of, of tools. Um, the Media Thread tool is one that's going to be talked about next, if I'm not mistaken. I plan on going to that event. Uh, and um, sort of broader web tools that are available to you over on the left-hand side. So. Um, on the left side, we've used some third-party tools. Some of them I talked about during the session today. Twitter and VoiceThread and Dropbox are a couple of them. But there are a number of other tools that we've used with folks over, over the last few years to really sort of expand the way that they do um, teaching and learning via their, their course management system. And as you can see, there are also a suite of tools that are curated on campus that, um, that are available as learning management system alternatives as well. So the CourseWorks in Sakai have a syllabus tool and an assignments tool and a feedback tool. You can use one or several of these other tools in combination to achieve similar goals. Because there are so many tools out there, though, it can be really difficult to navigate. And this is what the educational technologists at the Center for New Media Teaching and Learning do. I was once um, put on the spot by someone when I did a presentation like this. They said, what's the best educational technology tool out there? I said, well, it really depends on your scenario. He said, no, really, what's the best educational technology tool out there? I said, well, you know, like a doctor, I wouldn't say penicillin, you know, uh, or, you know, or codeine, or whatever, it, you know, whatever it is that, that really suits what your, what your illness is, whatever your problem is. So if, if I had to say, you know, I'd pro I would probably say like a wiki is sort of like, like aspirin. You know, it does a lot of good things, and if you don't take too much of it, you'll be okay. Um, so <laughs> that was the answer, actually, that I gave him at the time. But there are so many choices that are available to you, and I really do encourage you to talk with NET to find the specific thing. Because a lot of these tools, as I mentioned before, Wikispaces doesn't have a grade book, but feedback for individual papers can be offered within the Wikispaces context. These tools can be used in these specific ways that, um, that, that are traditional course management, traditional learning, learning management system tools. So you really can sort of fit many tools into many different roles, but there is the right tool that sort of fits the role best. Um, so if you wanted to do a project like distributed research, for example, a couple of the icons that are up here are for um, del uh, delicious. It's a great tool for distributed research. If you wanted to do a collaborative writing um, uh, uh, event with your students, Wikispaces is a great tool, but multiple people editing the same document at the same time can cause some problems. Has anybody used the new Google Docs with that sort of ghost in machine feature that they brought in recently? Four or five, six people editing the page simultaneously show up four or five, six people editing the page simultaneously. It's, it's weird. It's almost like the future, right? And so, so that's the type of, of tool that you might want to use in a live collaborative editing situation, whereas a wiki might serve the purpose otherwise. So there really are many different ways to do it, and uh, we really want to try to help you 
you find the one that's going to meet your needs best. And as New Yorkers, I thought I'd put this up here uh, and say, if you're planning a trip uh, around New York City, you have many options that are available to you, right? You've got the taxi if you've got some cash in your pocket. If you have a monthly MTA pass, the bus and subway might work out for you. You might want to come up with a DIY solution, right, and walk or, or ride a bike. Um, and so you've got a lot of different options. I put the 168th Street shuttle up there as well uh, if you wanted to get uptown. Uh, so we want to try to help you guide, we want to try to help guide you through all of these options that are available to you. All right. So just a couple of comments here in closing. Um, some of the ways that we do this, some of the ways that we try to guide you through um, the tools that are available out there are tools like our enhanced wiki, uh, sorry, our enhanced blog. It's at uh, ccnmtl.columbia.edu slash enhanced. And here we talk about educational technology tools that you uh, might want to look at. These are things that we've noted. They're little um, short blurbs that we write about tools that look interesting. There are also case studies where we talk about the ways that faculty have used these tools in their actual teaching. And then we have in-depth primers where we talk about um, real specific te technologies that we've used. I also can't emphasize uh, Michael Senemo's role enough and the other ETs, the educational technologists, visit 204, um, call 204, and work with, with a, your educational technologist for your specific department or with Michael. He, he's a great resource and uh, you can see him working there with a faculty member on a, on a site. Um, also our workshops. Next week we have workshops. Sign up. If you want to find out about any of these technologies or, or um, even ask questions about other ones, we, we have these sessions so that you can get together with your peers and learn from them. It's not only about learning about the, the specific technology and how to do the mechanics of it. It's about getting together and, uh, and talking about these things with your peers. And then finally, we have documentation. So at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're working on this and you can't quite get it to work right, there's documentation through a lot of these tools, but we also have written some of our own documentation. So. Um, We'd like to help you navigate the, this um, learning management system educational uh, landscape. And uh, these and other uh, LMS alternatives, they reflect the way that people work today. Um, many faculty members and students use Google Docs for their own work. This presentation here, for example, is in Google Docs. I was able to work on it at home last night. I didn't need to bring a, a, a data key or anything or email myself this document. I just worked on it. You know, other people worked on it as well, and it's a great way to collaborate. Um, so. Uh, it's just a small piece of code, as Michael showed earlier. Uh, you can embed this presentation right into a coursework site or right into a Sakai site. So it just reflects the way that a lot of people actually do their, their real work. Um, these LMS alternatives offer a different space. Okay, They offer a different way of thinking. And sometimes that sense of other can open up a student to a new way of expressing him or herself, expressing thoughts, and expressing the way that, that they relate to materials. Some of these alternatives tools will surprise you. You'll, like when you, when you are logged into Google Docs, when I did the, for the first time, when I was logged in and somebody else started editing, editing the document I was working on, I sort of jumped back for a second. It surprised me in the way that it was able to innovate and do new things. Um, you'll have more, I didn't know it could do that experiences. Um, and they can encourage activity beyond the class session. So that class blog that you set up, maybe something that's used during the semester, but you could also have that span semesters and years. It could be extracurricular in some ways. It could be a four-year course, but it could be something that's, that's, that accumulates over the course of years and that students even continue at, to use after they graduate. And perhaps most of all, these, the strengths tend to encourage students and faculty to gain agency in their teaching and learning. It improves uh, collaboration and it really sort of brings education up to the front and that's really what we want to try to do with this. Thank you all for coming. Come up and ask questions if you've got them. Thanks.